So next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Alex Langerman. He's an associate professor at Vanderbilt University's School of Medicine with faculty positions in their Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society in the Vanderbilt Institute for Surgery and Engineering. He's a, a fellowship trained head and neck surgeon. His research focuses on the intersection of ethics, management, and data science in the operating room. He's published on topics such as surgical ethics, video and data recording in the operating room, operating room efficiency, and the clinical care of head and neck cancer patients. In 2011, Dr. Langerman was nominated the first faculty scholar of the Buxbaum Institute of Clinical Ethics, and he completed the McLean Center's Clinical Medical Ethics Fellowship, as well as a master's degree in clinical and administrative data science at the University of Chicago. He was previously a faculty member at U of C, where he also formed and ran the Operative, Operative Performance Research Institute, which was a multidisciplinary think tank and investigative unit focused on improving surgical care. He has been awarded the Distinguished Faculty Award for Program Innovation for this work, which implemented major operating room efficiency improvements and broke new ground on the use of video and data collection in surgical settings. Today, he's going to be talking about transparency and ethics in the operating room. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. I did not talk about that. privilege to be here. Uh, it's one of the, the, the highlights of the year. And, you know, I want to thank people who have supported me and funded me uh, both in the past and currently. Uh, uh, the cool thing about the McLean Conference, you know, and congratulations on the 30 years, is, is that you know, with such an intense focus from the McLean's and the Buxbaum Foundation on the doctor-patient relationship, this incredible diversity of topics that we're hearing at this conference, every single one ties that thread through. And that is not seen at other places. And I think that's really special. And Mark, um, you're awesome. <laughs> so um, I also actually want to mentioned uh, Dr. Gordon's talk, which I thought was awesome uh, and really interesting research. And one of the things that it shows is if you had just scratch the surface of what patients might want to know about what goes on sort of behind the scenes, um, you not only discover amazingly sophisticated questions and probably way more information than you ever thought might even need to be shared, but you also see this diversity of patients, patients who really want to sort of make these decisions on their own and, and think through every nuance. And patients who really just want to trust in the system and say, please take care of me, this is, you know, this is complicated. And so I think that uh, reflects a bit on the talk today. So um, starting with a his historical perspective, um, the operating room used to be a wide open place. You know, nothing was hidden from what happened there. And um, there were, uh, uh, not only professional observers, you know, the uh, students who were learning or other colleagues, but uh, the public or even uh, family members, and to the point sometimes where they had to design furniture to keep the onlookers away from the operating surgeon because it was such an interesting uh, uh, spectacle. Um, you know, when medicine discovered that it's probably a good idea not to have a bunch of random people breathing on uh, the patient who's being operated on, instead of shutting down the ORs, they glassed in Ano, which also means operating room in Spanish, is, was the original sort of uh, transparent operating room where you could see through, and that's the Marquise de Busto who developed it in Spain. And this continued, and we think of the operating theater. In fact, it was designed much like this room is, uh, but with a, a glassed-in shell to allow the surgery to take a, a stage. Um, and even family members would be welcome into the operating room. This is something that seems kind of crazy to us today, but th there's the wife of that patient sitting there observing her husband's thoracoscopy. Um, people spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we extract the information that happens here in the operating room so that we can use it for training, we can use it to educate the public, we can use it to make surgery better. And uh, the American College of Surgeons, uh, even displayed live surgery during their clinical congress every year up until the 1960s um, and then it things stopped. We stopped seeing the operating room theater, we stopped seeing this sort of free flow of information out of the operating room. Why was that? Well, you know, one, surgery became a little less interesting. It was routine, it was safer, and so, you know, you could sort of not get as excited about many of the cases. Um, 
In fact, a kind of manufacturing mentality came over surgery with time and motion studies and uh, this idea of how can we fit as many operating rooms into a space because this was a, a huge money maker for the hospital. And so those things combined to create this kind of sequestered environment in the operating room where you know, uh, nothing was really shown. Now there's another reason that everything was shut off. I think it's obvious to people in the room, but the malpractice. Suddenly this data became a liability. And so it was not something that people were necessarily, uh, medical practitioners, 100% comfortable sharing from fears of being sued for something that might be seen and perhaps misunderstood. And so that's how we got this closed off operating room, authorized personnel only. And so it's very unusual to have anybody other than the staff that are supposed to be operating on that patient in a room. And it makes it very hard to gain information out of the operating room. And you know, this uh, means that things like teaching, errors, um, the logistics of the OR and efforts to be efficient. These things used to be out in the open and these are things that were, were remained hidden for a long time. And there are challenges to, at times when things get hidden. First of all, you have a perception disconnect between the patient and what actually happens in the OR. And then secondly, um, you know, there are truly no checks on what happens in the OR, which is its own problem and it's one of the benefits of transparency because what you don't want is for people to discover something that was going on and everyone thought it was okay who was doing it, but the, the public wasn't comfortable with it. And uh, this is a scandal that uh, sort of rocked the surgical profession in 2015. The Boston Globe released a spotlight report on overlapping and concurrent surgery when one surgeon has two rooms operating at the same time. I, I've done research on this. Um, we're not going to talk too much about it, but um, the point is that this is but one of the scandals that has rocked medicine and also all of our other professional institutions. This idea of sort of trust in institutions and it is slowly waning over the years to the point where the general American confidence in the institution is pretty low. On average about a 32 percent sort of confidence in any given institution uh, and uh, um, we, we got in just above the presidency so we'll see how they do. Um, and I think another aspect of this is because it sort of wasn't just out there and always sort of understood that residents sort of doing portions of procedures is part of surgery. It's been a part of surgery since the very beginning. I think that there's, when you, when you get the idea that uh, it actually might be happening to you as a patient, instead of saying, well, yeah, because that's kind of how things happen here, it's rather, a, oh, I didn't know that. Well, I don't, you know, I, I suppose I support that idea, but I'm not sure how I want it happening on me. And study after study has shown that patients are not really aware of the role of residents in surgery, nor uh, are they 100% comfortable with the idea of someone, quote, you know, learning on them. So um, I did some research uh, looking at uh, uh, overlapping surgery and interviewing patients. But out of this research, we had some other interesting insights which I want to share today. So. Um, Basically, what we did was we uh, showed, uh, there we go, uh, we interviewed patients one-on-one, -on -one. they had a research assistant, and then uh, we developed some themes out of that, and then later replicated the study in a larger survey. So this is data from both of those that's pretty consistent. And what you see is I showed them three scenarios. One is, you know, uh, you're getting your thyroid out, and we spend a lot of time explaining everything to the patients, what the different surgery means, the, the other thing, as if you're giving informed consent. And then we explained there's going to be a resident and an attending, you know, doing your procedure together. And when you get to the end of the case, the resident's going to close the incision and the attending is going to watch. And then we presented them with, asked them to rate that on a 100 point scale of how comfortable they were with that. Then we gave them two more scenarios. So one was uh, same scenario, but now instead of the attending being watching the resident, the attending was out of the room doing some paperwork, they could come right back. And then the third scenario was uh, they'd actually, the attending had left to go to another procedure and had assigned a cross-covering surgeon to sort of be there should the resident need any help. And this is a really common sort of surgical scenario. And also, you know, I think it's worth pointing out, we're talking about uh, an incision closure, not even a really complicated part of a procedure. And we asked patients sort of to rate their comfort with these three scenarios over time. Uh, and uh, what we found is that for scenarios one, two, and three, trust. on a scale of zero to 100, there was a group of patients who were relatively comfortable with kind of all three scenarios, not much change. And then there was a group that started to get sort of dissatisfied and that was really unhappy with this idea. And what I think is, is useful for this, not so much as to pre-classify patients in any way, but this is a signal 
this is that there's some dissatisfaction or some desire to have something different, and I think those are interesting people to study for that reason. And so what we found when we surveyed subgroup C in the larger survey, that they scored strongly on distrust of trainees and teaching questions. So these were questions that we pulled from different validated studies. And you can see that you, know, you better be cautious when dealing with teaching hospitals or you know, I wouldn't want any trainee working on me. And so I think those are important people to study. And one of the things we found was that when we asked them about why they felt that way, they discussed themes of control and fear of the unknown. Well, there's this person operating on me that I don't even know who that is, or how do I know that they're well-trained, or I haven't met that person, so I don't know, or the other theme that really came out was this idea is, well, if the attending is there, nothing's going to go wrong. They're going to make sure that nothing goes wrong, and this idea that it was a proxy for good outcome, that like the only way to get a good outcome is if you had the attending surgeon there. So um, this sort of begs this question, if we reopen sort of the doors of the operating room to everything that goes on, is it gonna harm training? You know, what are patients gonna want if they have more knowledge of what happens? And can we reintroduce this then in a way that supports training and, and efficiency? And so uh, one of the ways that you could do this is through video and audio, and I'm gonna talk about three ways. So um, for video, we did another step, general medical patients, what do you think about if we recorded everything in the OR? Like, would that bother you? Would you want to give consent for it? And what do you think you'd see, you know, if we, if we, you know, if you watched a video of your own surgery or a loved one's surgery? And, you know, these knowledge and control themes came up, again, in a subset of patients. You know, like that, you know, the video is helpful because that way no one can keep a secret from me. You know, it'll make sure the team does a good job because they know they're being watched. Um, and, you know, we've actually done a lot of exposing of the operating room uh, more and more. And uh, this is through social media and other video technology where people are recognizing that's important. Now, that has a risk. You peel back the curtain of the operating room and you're going to have things about it that people might not be 100% comfortable with. Maybe things that we should change. And, you know, I think really important topic of discussion. But additionally, you know, there's things like jovial and you know, having casual conversations about life because for surgeons, the operating room, although an incredibly important and sacred act, is also a day at the office. And you work with friends and you want to have chit chat when things are relaxed. You want to be able to sort of have a good time in the environment that you work in. And so there can be a challenge there. Also, you can get things like this. This is uh, Dr. Wendell Boutte, uh, a um, uh, surgeon-ish uh, who really <laughs> Um, yeah, released some videos on social media of her dancing around over the patients as they were being operated on. Now, she claims it was all staged and it was planned, um, you know, and with that came some other questions about her medical training, et cetera, so I think it became a complicated affair. Um, but when, you, when they interviewed her and said, well, why did you do this? There's probably a few reasons. Well, one is marketing, of course, but uh, the other is she talks about the idea of patients having a lot of anxiety around the OR. And when she showed them these videos of her dancing around, she said she felt a more fun place. It wasn't such an intimidating experience. Did I think she handled it right? No, absolutely not. But I think it's an interesting sort of eye into how some people think about the OR and how you can sort of screw up and, uh, and, and probably put something out there that's inappropriate. So, you know, for one thing, we think about, well, video can, um, you know, improve medical quality. Like, keep it within the profession. If we're constantly videoing everything and assessing our, improve, you know, our mistakes, we can see how we can make it better. And that's clear. Uh, but then you wonder, you know, what are the other potential benefits to society? And one place we can look is in law enforcement. That it, they've uh, introduced body cameras across multiple uh, 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 precincts around the, the country, departments around the country. And one of the things they found, of course, is that uh, it was really useful for assessing errors or mistakes or training. And that's, of course, the same thing that we see in the video in the operating room. Another thing that they saw was that, you know, for, for bad actors, it had a chilling behavior. So, so departments that were always sort of doing well, they introduced those body cams and didn't really change much. But the departments that had a lot of complaints or problems that started to improve it. The other thing that they noticed, and this is not something that's been formally measured in any way that I can Mind, but has been frequently reported is there are anecdotal senses that it improves trust in the, from the community. This idea that if there is monitoring, then perhaps uh, um, uh, the 
actions of the police officers are more likely to be in line with what they're supposed to do, which fits these themes of what patients perceive would be useful out of the OR. So I think for this first way of transparency, the critical need is determining how do you share these patients? What should we be sharing? Who has ownership rights over the, the, uh, the footage? And, and how in a way that doesn't intrude on the team or uh, disrupt their activities, but also provides more transparency to patients. So that's an area of active research. So a second way that we can improve uh, transparency is through the consent document. And Valerie had an awesome talk yesterday uh, about uh, the um, informed consent um, tort reform. And um, really what she highlighted was this sort of mishmash of a bloated document. You know, you saw the old thing where you just signed, I'm willing to have surgery, versus this giant document that we have here. And actually, there's some things kind of hidden in documents like this. This is just but one example of documents that we assessed across the country. And um, while you find that not only are there things that are sort of, people might really want to make sure that they understood, like uh, uh, trainees participating in the care, or the doctor being outside of the operating room, uh, but additionally, there's sort of information hierarchy in current informed consent. So, you know, um, I might need something done that like I didn't agree to just now, so you might do something else to me. Like that's kind of a big statement. I think it's an important statement and worth lots of discussion, but it's a big statement. And uh, you know, I might have some of the stuff that's removed from me studied in a problem or used for teaching and research. It's kind of interesting. It's not even a checkbox next to that. And those sit between, or uh, they bookend, before my operation or procedure, the spot on my body may be marked, which to me seems like, relatively speaking, a less important piece of information than the other two. And so I think one of the challenges we have with the informed consent document is just really opaque to patients. You think it's like, well, we're putting it all there, and we have these disclosures. And patients don't read it. And they often you know, are encountering it when it's an intimidating environment. And one of the patients who was looking at these documents as far as a, a part of a uh, investigation and patient's understanding said, I don't even have a spot. How are they going to mark it? Which I thought was pretty funny. Um, so anyways, uh, so critical need number two is uh, generate a surgical informed consent document that uh, supports this ideal process of decision making and disclosure uh, for patients. And so then third, and of course, the McLean Conference, we get back to the surgeon-patient relationship. So I talked to a lot of surgeons about how they talk to patients aspects of surgery about, about uh, you know, logistics. And you know, I think surgeons have picked up this idea that patients want to know that you know, there's some control in the OR. And this theme emerged. We saw that earlier in, in both of the patient interviews that we did. And so it's like, are you doing the case? You know, well, part of my role is to train surgeons, but they don't do anything without me. Like, you know, that it's, everything's under my control. And um, they also used a lot of analogy so a lot of like, well, you know, think about it. It's like you're flying a plane and there's two pilots and you know, I'm the more experienced pilot. And there's all sorts of stories like that of ways of like two people driving a car but one's given directions and they have all these ways of sort of euphemizing the uh, experience a bit but also sort of making it seem relatable, which I think is really interesting. And then third, there was a, groups of surgeons who said, you know, you gotta be cautious about how much you talk to patients. You know, once you start explaining what goes on, you're gonna get a lot more questions. And I think Dr. Gordon's research shows that really nicely too. You know, you start saying, oh, you might actually, we might do research on an organ, and they're like, oh, well, actually I got a bunch of questions. Now, the surgeons argue this would cause more anxiety than it would benefit anything. And, you know, this harkens back to some of the original discussions about informed consent. Should we even be talking about risks? The mere mention of the risks, something that we now consider absolutely central to a good informed consent, you talk about the risk, you're just going to scare patients. And that's what surgeons were arguing in the 80s. You know? And so I think that we really got to think about the validity of that, but also take a, that important voice into account. Um, one of the nice uh, quotes out of this uh, president's study of informed consent in the 1980s was this idea that you know, maybe euphemism seems like a good idea at the beginning, but unless you really explain what's going on, you could, you'd run the risk of causing more anxiety down the road. And they also talk about the fact that what's said, the way things are said is also as important as what's said. So I think the critical need number three here is to find the language of transparency for surgeons. I think ultimately that's where our big solution is going to be. We can throw tech at it. We can change the way the document looks. And I think those are going to be really important interventions. But I think you also need to think about how can we best explain this to patients one-on-one. -on -one. Patients 
very much rely on the trust that they feel with a, a physician as they work through their medical problems. And so how can we help enable that trust, but also be transparent about what really happens in the OR? Um, thank you very much. Morning. Thanks. Nick. No, I, I completely agree. And I think you hit on the idea of um, making it absolutely clear to anybody who might be participating in that that there is um, recording going on. And I think you know the other sort of question is, depending on the state that you're in, is going to be different flexibility with doing that recording for quality improvement anyways. In some cases, it's going to be uh, completely available to uh, any kind of uh, legal action versus uh, in other states, it's very much protected. And so I think that affects how people uh, adopt this. Oh. Yeah. where um, residents do get together in their call room or you know work room or wherever and talk you know sometimes complain about patients or might joke about medical facts I um, mean I think the question was whether that's ever acceptable whether that um, whether it's acceptable if it happens in the backstage kind of component so it sounds like what you're saying is you would potentially be taking the operating room from backstage back to front stage so it might raise professionalism but it might also create so much stress for the people who have to remain on stage all day that it would be worse. And I wonder what you think of that, if there's sort of a balance between the harms of the surgeons and the other OR staff having to be on stage all the time. I think that's one of the most important questions uh, of this kind of idea of videoing the OR. And in fact, the, the primary group um, behind it is uh, Theodore Grantrov out of the um, University of Toronto. And uh, he's been a huge pioneer in this. And they're now beginning to disseminate and actually have out to other hospitals beyond the University of Toronto. And this gives us a great opportunity of sort of assessing a pre and post state for staff. And James Young, one of, the, um, one of his uh, postdocs, um, uh, is studying this idea of physician burnout and uh, senses of you know, negative effects of Big Brother, so to speak. And there was a really interesting article that came out. Um, I think it was reported by Harvard, Harvard Business Review, but talking about TSA employees and the effect of constantly recording them on how they behaved at work. And so I think one of the most important questions is you don't want to have a negative effect on the OR team. You don't want to stress them out, or you don't want people, as we've seen, performing for the camera. We've done some research on awake patients, where you have an awake patient and the team is, you know, knows that, and ask surgeons how they change their behavior. And they obfuscated things, they sort of talked to the patient, they did other things that sort of changed the way they routinely do things in the operating room. And so I think we've got to be really careful about that potential effect. Yes, thank you. We have to cut off. All right. Are you done? Thank you so much, Dr. Langerman.